Hi, everybody. First, welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Eric Rosenblum. I work in the BizOps group. But more importantly, I'm an old friend of Mike's. And it's my honor to introduce him today as a speaker. I've known him for uh, over 10 years and lived in China with him for most of that period. And so it's very exciting to me to, to see his book come out. Um, a couple things about this book that I think are notable. The first is the timing. It, it's hard to write this book from a timing perspective because old Beijing is disappearing so rapidly. So you have to have someone that was there long enough to see it happen. But there weren't that many people that were there before, when, when old Beijing was all of Beijing that could have written this book. It had to be at a particular point of time. It's disappearing so quickly that it's really hard to imagine someone else doing the same kind of work because really next year and the year after, this is gone. The second is the person. There's a lot of books coming out China right now around the Olympics. A lot of journalists are just coming back home and so they're writing their books. The interesting thing about Mike is that he's written for the LA Times, for the New York Times, for you know, a host of, of great publications. But he had the devotion, the time, to actually live in a hutong for the last two years. Uh, you don't find many journalists in China who are willing or able to do that. And so it, it takes kind of a unique combination of the timing and the person to make a book like this. And finally, the subject. I, I think that this is a complex subject. There's a lot of nostalgia for old Beijing. Uh, but at the same time, the life that he was living in old Beijing can be a painful, uncomfortable, difficult life. The people who are living like that are not museum pieces for our nostalgia or to, 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 to uh, verify a vision of China that we have. And it's also a good framework uh, that, that posts a lot of the issues around China, which is the tension between tradition and, and modernization, um, the direction of China. I think a lot of that is captured in what is going on with the way people live in China and even the rights of people that live there, the rights of the individuals who've built their lives and their homes there. So I think it's quite an interesting framework. Um, and so I'm really happy that Mike has written the book because like I said, if he didn't, there's not a lot of time left to write a book like this. Um, so just the formal introduction to Mike, and I, I shouldn't have to read the flap because I do know the guy. Um, but he first came to, uh, to China in 1995 with the Peace Corps uh, in, the, in the wilds near Chongqing and Sichuan. Um, he is a Lowell Thomas Award winner for travel writing and published in Times, Smithsonian, New York Times Book Review, yada, yada, yada. And um, this is his first book. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Mike, but one second. Um, there'll be time for 10 minutes for questions at the end, and please use the microphone behind. Um, and it's my pleasure to, uh, to welcome Mike to Google. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Mike, I'm live? Yeah? Thanks, Eric. Eric f failed to mention that he actually gave me my first job in Beijing. When I left the Peace Corps and I came to Beijing in 1997, Eric was one of the founders of a website called ChinaNow.com. I remember he, he hired me to be a content provider, and I remember he, is, uh, he paid me the princely th sum of 12 cents a word. And I remember telling Eric, like, Eric, I really need more money. And I remember I got a raise to 20 cents a word, but then the company went belly up a year later, so I, I blame me. Um, as Eric mentioned, um, I went to China in 1995 with the Peace Corps. I had no interest in China. I, it, I wasn't one of those people that said, oh, I must go to China. I know Chinese. I want to be there. Instead, I was going to be a Spanish teacher. I grew up in Minnesota. I went to University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I was doing a lot of volunteer work for United Farm Workers, Urban League, and others. So I signed up for Peace Corps, and I thought, great. I speak Spanish. They'll send me to a Latin American country. Peace Corps called and said, how about Vladivostok? And I said, no, they don't speak Spanish there. And they said, how about Malawi? And I said, no, they don't speak Spanish there either. And they kept going down this list, Kiribati, Turkmenistan. Uh, and it, it got longer and longer. And I finally said, no, I don't want to do any of that. I want to go where I can speak Spanish. And the person snapped at me and said, this is Peace Corps. It's not Club Med. And he hung up the phone. And I was student teaching then. And I was, had a horrible day teaching. I was laying in the middle of the floor of my classroom. My kids were in an assembly called We're All in the Same Gang. And uh, the phone rang, and the guy said, China. And I said, you're kidding me. I didn't know Peace Corps was in China. And he said, well, it's not officially Peace Corps. It's the US-China Friendship Volunteers, because Chairman Mao had slandered uh, Peace Corps' name as a CIA front, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, I said, OK, I'll go. And he said, you leave in three weeks. Go to the airport, meet the package of forms. So I went, and three weeks later, I was on a plane to China. I didn't speak any Chinese. I couldn't use chopsticks, the whole deal. So that was 1995, and as Eric mentioned, I went uh, to Sichuan in the southwest. I learned how to speak Chinese. In 1997, I moved to Beijing. But I wasn't living in this part of Beijing. 
This is old Beijing, what's called Laochang, the old city. This wall you see here, this whole perimeter is the former imperial city wall. And the area of old Beijing is 25 square miles. So it's about the size of Manhattan, half the size of San Francisco. And I was living somewhere out here in the suburbs. And after a few years, I realized I could be living anywhere. I might as well be in Cleveland. I'm not really experiencing anything about Beijing. And I also started noticing that whenever I came into the city, restaurants I enjoyed, neighborhoods I enjoyed walking through were gone. They were piles of rubble. And after a while, those, rubble, those piles of rubble kind of became dots that started, I started connecting in my head into a story, which was that the city was being indelibly altered, and no one was writing about this. So in 2005, this is the Forbidden City right here at the center of old Beijing. This is Tiananmen Square. This is the front gate. And this neighborhood right here is called Da Jalan. So in 2005, I did what you do in China when you're looking for an apartment. I went on Google and uh, started looking for housing ads. And I found a, a courtyard, an old courtyard to live in here. But by the time I signed the lease papers, the landlord called and said, bad news, your house was destroyed. So I moved across <laughs> the street here to Da Jalan. Now, this area of Beijing fascinates me. This is the front gate. This is one of the last extant gates of the old city wall. This is at the south edge of Tiananmen Square. Uh, it doesn't look incredibly Chinese because a German architect redesigned it in 1901. And he added these little marble eyebrows over each embrasure and added this balustrade. But when I started looking for a house, I knew I wanted to live somewhere near this. I wanted to live outside uh, Tiananmen Square, Great Hall of the People. So this landlord, who, whose house had been destroyed, called and said, look, I have an idea. Everything in Beijing works horizontally, by the way. These lanes are very long and narrow. They're no wider than maybe this space here in the room. And everything moves horizontally in Beijing, just like these lanes. All the houses are connected. They're one story tall. They're built on a one-to-one -one ratio, which means the street is as wide as the house is tall. So it's really nestled in feeling. And the landlord said, look, why don't we just walk through the lanes and I'll start talking to people. Maybe they'll find you a house. And so we walked and we walked. And one of the things we walked under is this gate. This is what gives the neighborhood Da Jalan its name, Da Jalan. It means a big fence or a big wicker fence. Through successive dynasties, uh, all the good stuff in Beijing, brothels, opium dens, tea houses, theaters, restaurants, tea houses, were all moved to this neighborhood outside the old city wall. So this neighborhood kind of became the Chinatown of, of Beijing. So it has this really rich history. Really, when you think of Peking Duck or Peking Acrobats, Peking Opera. Yes, sir? Uh, when, were, uh, when were those photos taken? Uh, those photos from the 1920s. Thanks. I'll keep showing modern ones as I go. Good question. Um, so everything that you think of as Chinese flourished in this neighborhood. So again, to review, this is, this is Chairman Mao's mausoleum here on Tiananmen Square. This is the front gate, which we just saw a picture of. And then Da Jalan, this neighborhood, is this big chunk right here. I love Google Earth. I can't tell you. <laughs> I use it all the time in Beijing. Um, this neighborhood, Da Jalan, is only a half square mile. Now, Vatican City is a half square mile. Vatican City has 500 people living in it. This half square mile has 57,000 people, most of them in single story homes. It's one of the densest urban environments in the world. Uh, this is my lane right here. What interested me about it is that if you look at a map from the 1920s, the structure of the neighborhood is the same. So much of Beijing you know, is being redrawn. New Beijing is bigger, wider, flatter, more. But this neighborhood, even in the 1920s, you know, it still retains this square shape. The lanes, footprints are still there. And then looking back, this map is from 1757, before the United States became a country. Same footprint. This is my lane right here. And this is my house that I ended up renting. This is the outside of the house. That's my bike. Our roof needs weeding, as you can see. Um, it's, it formerly, it was really interesting. In the book, I talk about how hard it is, how hard it is to research Beijing history. Because a lot of documents have been lost. Beijing was occupied by the Japanese. Beijing was governed by the nationalists. It was governed by warlords. It was an imperial capital. It's gone through very, a lot of turbulent eras in the 20th century. This house was owned by a merchant. I found tax records going back to the 1920s. And it was owned by a single merchant who sold traditional medicine right here in this shop. The hutong is actually named after his shop. I live on 
Red Bayberry and Bamboo Slanted Street. Um, Hutong are to Beijing what the canals are to Venice. Okay, so just picture this really intricately laced uh, web of little streets. Often they're named for things that used to be sold there. So you see Pineapple Lane, or you see Silk Lane, and whatnot. So I live on Red Bayberry Lane, which is a medicinal herb that he sold here. What's interesting about the house to me is that he divided it into four courtyards inside. This is the front door, and we're walking toward the back now to my house. Um, it wasn't one single courtyard in the center. Instead, he divided it up. And then this is looking into my room. The neighborhood thinks I'm a big landlord because I have two rooms. Most people only rent one room. I have, this is my living room here, and then my bedroom is next door. Uh, you can see there's not much space. There's no pomegranate tree or a tea table inside. Starting in 1956, Beijing's vernacular architecture, these courtyard homes, came under city management. And so you no longer, in most cases, you no longer owned your courtyard anymore. Instead, the city would assign people to move into your courtyard with you. Over the last 50 years, because people didn't own their houses outright, they didn't put much of their own money into their upkeep. So Beijing architecture is already permeable. It's not like when you go to Europe and you see these grand cathedrals or stadiums from, from, from times past that are built from stone. Instead, Beijing's architecture, as you can tell, is, it's built by wood, and then my, my walls are made out of straw mixed with clay, mixed with pig's blood. So this is a kitchen that someone added to our courtyard, and then this is another single room that someone lives in, and then that's my area. So I thought, if I'm going to talk about the loss of heritage in Beijing, I better live in it and experience it and see if it's worth saving in the first place. It's interesting about this. We don't have a bathroom. We don't have hot water, but I have broadband internet. Yeah. <laughs> That's Beijing in a nutshell right now. You know, The telecom bureau came and they strung a wire over our, our roof and down into the house and so I could be online, which I like because I'm an A's fan, so I listen to baseball in the morning. This is how the Beijing police picture themselves. Very cheerful. <laughs> uh, the, the police really didn't want me moving into this neighborhood. I mean, it's 57,000 people. Uh, there aren't any foreigners who are registered to live there full time. They thought it was a terrible idea. They thought I was going to cause problems for them. You can see here it says, lock your doors, windows and doors, and receive strangers carefully. And I said, who are you trying to protect me from? What's the big deal? And they said, oh, this is a very dangerous neighborhood. We have all sorts of elements that you don't want to mix with. And I said, oh, yeah, I see what you mean. So this is, <laughs> this is outside my house. You can see how narrow the lane is here. There's a taxi cab making, making its way through. Uh, these are some girls at the school I teach. Every time I have a picture of this girl, she's always eating. Which I think is interesting. <laughs> it's, you know, it's funny, you look at things over time. Um, th this house, actually, they put a solar water heater on top of their roof, so they actually have hot water inside the house. But you can see, I mean, there are, the Beijing government isn't wrong to say these neighborhoods are dilapidated. dilapidated. Um, this house has no, you'd say, heritage value. It was built after the earthquake in 1976. So it's, it's, it's not the opulent grandeur you associate with courtyards. So the book is about this intangible cultural heritage that's being lost, not just the architectural heritage. Because I really found every morning when I wake up and walk down to the latrine to go to the bathroom, you, know, you start noticing patterns of life uh, that people live. This is Mr. Lau across the street, and he brings his bird out every morning, takes his bird for a walk. He sits underneath it and uh, plays chess. This is Auntie Yang. She has her own courtyard here. That's about it for vehicular traffic in the Hutong. You see strollers. You see an occasional donkey cart, believe it or not, still. Uh, we don't have any cars that come through. This is our traditional breakfast. Shalom Ba. We <laughs> have uh, dumplings here. This is my neighborhood's main street, our market street. It's called Yen Shoujie, or uh, Prolonged Life Street. And I had an urban planner walk through the neighborhood once, and he said, Oh my word, everything you need except for open heart surgery is within a 15 minute walk of your house. And it's true, I mean, this is, we have restaurants on the street, we have a grocery store, uh, you get your newspaper here. This store right here where I'm pointing actually started selling pet food. Incomes have risen enough that people are starting to get dogs and cats. You buy your cat food by the scoop instead of a bag. And um, these kids right here 
are in grade four, and although we don't have cars in the hutong, they have to wear the yellow cap assigned by the Beijing school district that warns uh, safety, that it's supposed to make them visible to cars. I like this picture. By the way, this is by Mark, a lot of these photos are by Mark Leong, who shoots for uh, National Geographic. He's from Sunnyvale. I like this picture because these kids are in grade four, and they're wearing their safety hats and their track suits, but these two girls are in grade six. So they think they're too cool for that stuff. So they've chucked their hats and their tracksuits. Kids are just like they are in the States. Now, I knew from Peace Corps that I didn't want to just live in a neighborhood. I had to have a role. Otherwise, I would just be the foreigner who sits there and stares at people all the time. So I went to the neighborhood elementary school, which is on Tar Hutong, Coal Lane Elementary. And I said, look, I want to be a volunteer. And they said, a volunteer? What's that? And I said, no, really. Like, I'll do this for free. I did it in Peace Corps. Um, I knew the monthly salary at the school paid what one day when I taught at the international school paid. So I knew they couldn't afford uh, to hire me. So I said, look, I'll do it for free. They were completely incredulous at this idea. It's the same way when I was in Peace Corps. Chinese used to feel sorry for me and they would say, what kind of a nation sends its kids away for two years to help strangers and not help their own family? So it was the same thing with this. People really didn't understand why I wanted to volunteer. Sean Pelan here is wearing her ancha and her safety hat. Um, so it took three months to get approval, and then I was approved. It was a huge vetting process. The kids study English in a book uh, narrated by a monkey named Maki. Now, it's very impressive, I have to say, that Beijing, from grade one, all students have to start learning English. They have three 45-minute lessons a week. It sounds great. However, most instruction is automated. You can see a little cassette icon here on the top. Where'd I go? And Maki is, he sounds like Truman Capote on helium. If you can imagine that, it's like, oh, it's, nobody can understand him. And so the kids, a lot of the instruction in Beijing is automated. It's on DVD or it's on cassette. And the kids sit and listen to Maki, but they can't understand what he's saying. And so they turn to me, and then I would say, I don't understand it either. And so we end up reading the subtitles a lot of times. So my kids can read better than they can uh, actually speak. This is my classroom. Uh, I, this is in autumn of 2005. That's my pointer here. You can see on the blackboard already, three years before the event, Beijing 2008 was chalked up. Not love the motherland, not do's and don'ts for civic virtue or whatnot. It was all about the Olympics. Instruction was really centered on the Olympics, but to a point. Just like here, we have civics classes and whatnot. It's a great idea maybe at the top, but it always isn't implemented at the lower level. Beijing schools are amazing right now. I mean, there are some schools with climbing walls, with swimming pools, with artificial turf uh, soccer pitches and whatnot. Our school isn't one of those. Our school is a very poor school in a very old neighborhood. Every classroom in Beijing has to keep a countdown how many days left until the Olympics start, okay? Most schools have it on an electronic board. My school did it on chalkboard. So here we have 877 days to go. But I think what's great about this is in my, my two years in the school, never once did I see the right day on the blackboard. Every classroom kept its own count. Some people said there was 900 days until the Olympics, there was 500 days of the Olympics. It was up and down. So again, you know, to humanize the situation here, I know you hear a lot about all oh, the Olympics are coming, the government's very excited and stuff. At the elementary school level, we were a little confused still. We didn't, nobody really knew what this meant for the school. Now this is the best part of my job, uh, aside from the students. This is the view out my classroom window. If you've been to Beijing, maybe you recognize this. This is the Western Hills out here. This is a rare, clear day, by the way. If you go to Beijing, definitely go in like April or October when the weather is the best. But you know, again, we're only a half square mile, so on the edge of our neighborhood, you could see these new buildings and this modernity you know, encroaching. I used to play a game with my students where we'd lean out the window, and I would point at a piece of architecture in the distance, and they would have to tell me what it was. And I would point out the front gate, and they'd try to guess what it was, or I'd point out the Great Hall of the People, the parliamentary building, and they'd guess, and they, they often got it wrong. You know? <laughs> but um, one day they pointed out the window at the Golden Arches, and they all yell, McDonald's! They all knew that one. And then at the end of the school year, uh, this building right here, it's my pointer. This building right here is a Walmart. So by the end of my first year in the neighborhood, this new Walmart had gone up. So I was, it was evident that I needed to stick around and keep recording. One thing I like about this photograph, too, is that Beijing people often call the Hutong a sea of green. 
Just how green they are. And I was thinking, what are you talking about? Hutong walls are gray. You know, it doesn't have a lot of uh, color. But when you get up, you see how many trees are actually in the lanes still and in courtyards, which is different than a lot of the new Beijing suburbs. This is outside Walmart. This is interesting. You have the, um, you have the people still selling their stuff right here on, on blankets. And you have people selling oil cakes. The Walmart is like a hutong, only under one roof. There's an optometrist, there's a jeweler, there's a newsstand, there's a hairstylist, there's a manicurist, it's all there. And I thought at first that my, my neighbors really wouldn't like Walmart being there, but they love it. Grandmothers love it because it's air conditioned and heated. And you'll walk in, Beijing weather is sweltering in summer, and you'll go in in the summertime and there'll be all these grandmothers like standing in the aisles. No one's actually buying anything, but they're just chatting like they would outside on the street. But now it's like a bean. You know, they're in this air conditioning or in this heated environment. Uh, they really like it. This is a boy doing his traditional sword play outside the Walmart sign there. <laughs> this neighborhood's gone now. They tore this down in April. Now, how are houses? What, what do I mean when I say, you know, Eric mentioned old Beijing is disappearing. Why and how? It's not due to the Olympics, surprisingly enough. Um, none of these great, beautiful stadiums you see on the news, like the Bird's Nest and the Water Cube, none of those were built inside the old city, inside that 25 square mile area. They're all built to the northern suburbs or to the western suburbs. In fact, no Olympic event is happening inside the old city except for the marathon, which runs through my neighborhood. When Beijing first wanted to bid for the Olympics, they wanted to bid for the 2000 Olympics that went to Sydney. Um, and in 1991, the city started the old dilapidated housing renewal program, which was tied to that, Weifang Gai Zhao. And they started uh, this idea that you would move from the city edges inward, and you would tear down this old housing rather than fix it up, and you could, you could renew it. You could build new courtyard homes on that site. That policy took place at a time when the economy opened up. Cities are financed differently in China than they are here. There's no deficit financing. There aren't bonds. There aren't referendums where you go and vote on how money will be spent. Instead, the central government said, from now on, every district in Beijing should try to fund itself. The way those governments started funding themselves was to transfer land rights. So starting in 1991, district governments in Beijing started transferring land rights to developers who certainly didn't want to rebuild these courtyard homes and let the original community live there. They wanted to build higher buildings or office space, something that could be more profitable. So starting in 1991, this symbol would appear on your house overnight. In the book, I call it the hand does it, because no one's ever really sure who comes and paints these <laughs> symbols on your house. But it means chai. It means uh, destroy or raise. From 1991 to 2001, when this symbol went on your house, the government would reassign you a new apartment often in the far-flung suburbs. Starting in 2001, they started giving you compensation. Compensation starts at $1,000 a square meter. But keep in mind, a lot of these houses are quite small. The space you have, maybe only 60, or 60 meters. Um, but land in the city is worth three to four times that much. I mean, now in Beijing, it's like $4,000 a square meter to start building. So even now, when people get their compensation payments, they have to buy elsewhere. And it should be said that a lot of people really want to move. A lot of people don't want to live next to neighbors that were assigned to them. They don't want to have you know, uh, no plumbing or heat. But what they all miss in common is the community that they lived around. Now, having said that, the Olympics are playing a part in the reshaping of old Beijing and Beijing in general. This is on a house that's going to be destroyed. It says, construct a new Beijing, welcome a new Olympics. The city's slogan for its 2001 Olympic bid was, new Beijing, new Olympics. So there is a lot of construction going on. Somebody told me that um, a city planner in New York said when New York was bidding for the 2016 games, they were budgeting $2.5 billion for New York City. Beijing has already spent over $40 billion preparing for the games. A lot of the changes have been quite good, actually. New subway lines, uh, more green space. In the book, I follow characters. The book is all character-based. It's about people and, and what's going on in the neighborhood and the changes they're, they're going through. This is after you're, you get this white symbol painted on your house. Posters go up on your street. And these gentlemen here are looking at, this is a street name, and then all the numbers of the houses that are going to be destroyed. So they look like kids checking the exam results. But they're looking at if their house is listed. And then all this here is legal, legalese. You know, your rights, how do you appeal, 
how do you uh, negotiate for more money? One of the things that in, in my neighborhood, when they started doing the renewal, uh, a lot of slogans went up that said, restore the ancient capital's appearance. You know, we're going to bring back old Beijing. On those signs, it would say, restore the ancient capital's appearance. There would be so, uh, pictures of what was to come. So you could see it's an old, you know, they destroyed original architecture, rebuilt architecture to look old, and the tenants are Starbucks and Pizza Hut. There's also a big new Apple store in my neighborhood, which is odd. So after uh, the notice goes up, after you go to the office and you negotiate a compensation payment, you can hold out for more money. In the book, I follow people that really go through the process. Uh, but you're encouraged not to hold out. They'll switch off your water and your electricity to try to force you out. But literally, like when you sign the papers, within a week, they come and knock down your house so people can't return to it or uh, squat in it. But you notice they save the trees. Beijing's very conscious right now of its green cover. So this is the same location. That's in autumn 2006. This is spring 2007. Same neighborhood right there. This is a brand new road through the neighborhood. Uh, it ends at Tiananmen Square. This block building right here is the city planning exhibition hall. And so many people went to it, bought a ticket, demanded their money back, <laughs> that now there's a big notice on the window when you buy your ticket. It says, nothing in this exhibit will tell you when or if your house will be destroyed. No refunds. <laughs> Not a lot of transparency. That's another thing people complain about. Where you see this vehicle right here is where I used to sit and eat these. This is Dao Xiao Mian. I know, isn't that good? I, it's, my mouth waters when I look at it. The people who make that is the Leo family. That's the mom. And Soldier Leo is in the middle. He's in the People's Liberation Army. And then the father. And they're characters in the book. They're people I follow. I'm fascinated by them because they were living in Shanxi, they had a farm, and one day the mom just came and said, I want to go to Beijing and make noodles. I think we can make a living. And the son and father said, come on, mom, you're crazy. And she said, no, the economy is really good. We could probably make a go of it. And so they came to Beijing, and they made a go of it. And they had a very successful restaurant. Because they rented the restaurant and didn't own it, when the hand came through and said, we're going to tear down the street, they received no compensation. So they were, they were out on the street. And it's funny, you know, I've been a journalist in China. When you're a journalist in China, you, I always felt, anyway, the reason I don't want to be a journalist is I always felt I was getting the story wrong. How do you know things won't change? How do you know things won't get better? And the, the economy is robust enough and China's flexible enough right now that people do land on their feet. So in the book, I follow them uh, for two years as they look for a new space, which they found, and now they're quite successful. This is outside their new restaurant in my neighborhood. Another character in the book is Recycler Wong. Here he is with the bottles in his hands. He's out, he's out front of my house every morning with that big old scale. I asked Recycler Wong once, how do you make money? I don't get it. And his response was the same as Milo Minderbinders in Catch-22. I don't know if you've read Catch-22, but Milo would buy eggs for 10 cents and sell them for 5 cents and make a profit. And someone said, Milo, how? And he said, volume. And that's the same with, <laughs> that's the same with Recycler Wong. He, you know, he pays one one-thousandth of a cent for these bottles, and he fills up these sacks. And then in the book, I go with him to Trash City, which is this huge recycling dump landscape outside of Beijing. And he sits and haggles with people out there. He sells his bottles to one family, who sell it on to another buyer. And he sells his pillows to another family, and he sells his bed springs to another family. And he'll take anything. I'm amazed. Like, he'll take the caps off my beer bottle. He'll take, he'll take anything. The newspaper, when I'm done reading it, no price too small. He's been kicked out for the Olympics, unfortunately. They said he was unsightly, but the neighborhood loves him. He, he knows all the news. He's from Hunan. This is another character in the book. This is my star student, little Leo, and her father. Her father is a security guard at a gift shop on Tiananmen Square. He's a night watchman, and he laughs about it. He says, Tiananmen Square must be the highest concentration of security in the planet, but they hired me to watch these little knickknacks you know, at night. But he said it makes him, it's a good job. This is on the roof of his home. Uh, he, like a lot of old Hutong Lane residents, raised pigeons for a hobby. And these pigeons are in the pigeon jail because they've been misbehaving. But he goes up and he has these battles. These guys with these pigeon coops in Beijing have these battles where they send their pigeons up and then they wave flags and they use food and they try to lure other people's pigeons into their coop. <laughs> and then once a week they have prisoner of war exchanges. And they show up and they give each other their birds back. I think it's so awesome. 
He's also started racing his pigeons, which I realize is a, a proxy way of gambling because uh, he pays an entrance fee and then you can win a huge purse. So now he spends a lot of his time uh, on the weekends out in the suburbs racing pigeons. People always ask me, well, Beijing is being destroyed. Aren't people doing anything to stop it? And the answer is yes. Beijing has changed rap. I mean, I first moved there in 97, and it's head spinning the changes as far as openness, citizen participation, muckraking journalists. Uh, one man in my neighborhood, Zhang Jinqi, he's in the book as well. He spends his time going house to house, taking photographs, writing down oral histories. And he said, in Chinese history, usually you record famous events or catastrophes. Very seldom do you sit down and actually record people's stories. So he's one of the first right now that is doing that. He's unpaid. This is the star of the book. This is the widow. This is my neighbor. She lives in the courtyard, in the room opposite my courtyard. She raised uh, two kids in 65 square feet of space. She has one room. She always has the Beijing Opera Channel turned on, so our courtyard is blares with peaking opera. And uh, she's, she's lived in this neighborhood about 60 years now. Most of her adult life, she's lived here. When I moved in the first day, she looked at me. I thought she was going to say, no foreigners allowed. You know, what do you think you're doing, buddy? Instead, the first day I moved in, she looked at me and said, I have one rule. One rule, little plum blossom. That's my Chinese name. I said, what's your rule? She said, public is public, private is private. I said, OK. I'm going to read to you the first page of the book. The widow opens my door without knocking. A trail of flying horse brand cigarette smoke enters behind her. An old cotton cap hides coarse, mortar-colored hair brushed back from her brow to reveal a gold loop in each ear. She wears a fleece vest and forearm mufflers that match the vermilion and crimson wood beams of our courtyard home. When I picture my neighbor, the widow, I see these colors, dull whites and grays, lustrous yellows, imperial reds, and smell ashes and age. She is the shade and scent of our hutong. Little Plum Blossom, listen, you have to eat before class. I stand before her in a t-shirt and boxer shorts. The widow scrapes the end of a pair of chopsticks and places them in my hand. Eat, Little Plum Blossom. She uses an endearment short for my Chinese name. I call her Danyang, a term of respect for an elderly woman. The widow extends a steaming bowl of dumplings with two hands. Her eyes squint from the cigarette smoke curling up her sallow cheeks. She stuffed the dumplings with pork and chives, my favorite. You know, she says, it's too hard to cook for one person, so you have to eat these. Every morning for two years, that was my introduction to the day. I didn't have to have an alarm clock because she was right there. <laughs> She's awesome. We fight all the time, too. It's not like this. It's not, I don't want to give you this picture of like, oh, how cute, a little house on the prairie. We are in each other's face all the time. The public is public thing, forget about it. <laughs> She's unrelenting. Now, there are some really great things. I mean, one of the reasons I've stayed in Beijing, and Eric can speak to this too, anybody who's been to Beijing often falls in love with it. I mean, it's, it's an easy city to be seduced by. Um, I'm from Minnesota. My favorite thing in the world is to play hockey. And in the wintertime, every morning at about 7 a.m., I come here. This is the moat of the Forbidden City. And if you believe it or not, they actually have a skating rink there. And so I play with these same 10 guys every morning, every winter. And we just play, and it's loose and fun, and nobody's cranky, except uh, they always want to stop to smoke. So we play, and then they have a cigarette, and then we start playing some more. But the sun comes up right over that, that gate, that, that wall, the palace there. It's beautiful in the morning. Now, the bad thing, though, is that I don't have hot water at home, nor do I have a shower. And so this, this is the propaganda I see when I bike home from ice skating, when I'm sweat, sweaty, and the, the sweat's freezing to me, and I'm freezing. Um, this is prevent coal poisoning. You see these warnings all over the lanes. And it's because people burn coal honeycomb cakes, this pressed coal into a cake. They burn that for heat. So you can imagine it's eye-watering. I mean, the sulfur that comes out of it. Um, and I choose not to do it because my first winter in the lane, my, one of my star students, her parents asphyxiated. They, she woke up. They didn't. So I thought, OK, I'm not going to do that anymore. And then I bought an electric heater. But when I plugged it in, it blew the circuit in her house. <laughs> and the widow came in and said, you idiot, what are you doing? So I unplugged my refrigerator. And now my refrigerator stores my underwear. <laughs> now, another bad thing about the lanes is that we don't have a bathroom. So this is where I go. Um, this is 10 minutes from my door. 
This is a walk that I have timed flat, you can imagine. I can do this blindfolded, I can do this drunk, I can do it any way you shape. What's funny about it, it's, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, I go to a bathhouse and there's no partitions there, and so you're, you're just used to being exposed. I don't have a lock on my door, people are always coming over. So I'm used to living publicly, that's okay. Um, but the latrine is you go in and there's holes on the, you know, slats on the ground and there's no partitions and you stare at each other. And that even didn't bother me that much. But what's really changed in the last year in Beijing is that advertising is all over the city now. You used to never see billboards or ads, but now advertising covers everything. Bus stops, bus seats, the whole works. Cabs have little TVs in the back, you know, when you're sitting there. Well, that advertising trend has spread to the bathrooms. So, <laughs> even... <laughs> Even in a latrine, uh, I look at this guy. This says control hemorrhoids. Go to Dongda Hospital for Anus and Intestine Disease. And it lists a whole bunch of symptoms that you could be checking yourself for as you're doing your, uh, your duty. I really want to find this guy. If anybody can do a Google search for this guy, I want him to know that he's on bathrooms all over Beijing. <laughs> His agent probably told him, like, I got a great gig for you. And he had no idea what he was getting into. Now, another bad thing about the neighborhood is it's really, there's no open space. I mean, it's very, very constrained. Uh, this is the biggest space in our neighborhood, and this is the schoolyard. These are the kids out doing their morning exercises. You can see there's one basketball hoop. That's because the yard isn't wide enough to put the other basketball hoop. So they actually put the other basketball hoop next to it. I wish I had a picture of it. Ah, is this gone? It's right here, right off camera. And so... The kids, when they play basketball, they play on this hoop, they run out to half court, and then they go shoot on that hoop. So you play, you're still playing teams, but you're just doing it in an in a arch instead. Now, having said that, though, I have to say, that New Beijing, even when it does have open spaces, often constrains you in how you can use them. This is a typical sign in a typical new park. You know, basically, don't have any fun whatsoever. There's often security guards that are on the perimeter to tell you, keep off the grass, you know, don't throw a frisbee, don't try anything funny. So another thing about you know, Beijing and what it looks like, this is a suburb uh, out between Beijing and Tianjin. I mean, these are the kind of new developments that are being built up around Beijing. This is Carmel, the California pure life. <laughs> another one you see is this one sells the United States of America. <laughs> and the ones around Beijing, you know, they're named Yosemite, they're named Napa Valley, they're named Dating Bright California, Park Avenue, uh, the whole deal. And it sounds great. And people always say to me, wow, Chinese really want to live like Americans do. And I say, no, they don't want to live like Americans do. They want to live like Chinese do. They just want to live with modern conveniences. And the reason I say that is these communities, it seems kind of American, but they're not like communities here. Again, there's, there's no referendums on how money will be spent. Um, there isn't a, a public open stack public library. There isn't a church or a temple that you can go to. There isn't a community center. A lot of the things we take for granted here uh, aren't there. And this is what a lot of these places look like. I mean, the, the truth is that they do resemble America in terms of that you need a car to access them. The widow is terrified to move to one of these. And I said, why? And she said, because if I live up high and I'm downstairs and the elevator breaks, I'm going to have to sleep outside because <laughs> she can't climb the stairs to get back in. And a lot of people in old Beijing really feel this. They call it JDT, connected to the Earth's energy. You know, the widow likes to rub her hands on wood. She likes to put her foot on the, on, the, on the mud on the lane or touch the granite of our step. She likes to touch the five elements. And she says, if you live in these apartments, it's bad for your health because you can't do that. This is another lane by my house that was just torn down. Uh, you can see the white chai mark on the, on the door there. This is the house of my co-teacher, who's a star of the book too, Miss Zhu. Uh, she grew up in this house, and when we came here the day it was going to be destroyed, I was amazed at how she wasn't angry. She, was, she wasn't too wistful either. And I was walking around taking notes on everything, and I was studying these beautiful drum stones here at the door that keep the, keep the door in place, these beautiful things here. And I was making etchings of these and stuff, and she had no interest in any of that and said she was down the lane by herself, and she was looking at the trees because the trees for her were things she remembered as a kid. Chinese like to bang the, the leaves off them in the springtime and fry them up you know, with eggs or something. So for her, it was very personal. It wasn't the house. It was the lane. It was the trees. It was her memories from that time. This is another view of it here. It's interesting. When you walk around these neighborhoods and when they're being destroyed, um, there's very little police presence. 
I mean, people, once they sign the contracts, are willing to move. And even I, people always ask, like, how did you do this? How did you live there in this neighborhood and record all this stuff? Weren't the police concerned? The police weren't concerned at all with me. In fact, they were a little too friendly. Um, <laughs> one day, they called urgently, and they said, you have to come into the office. And I said, what? Am I in trouble? Are you going to kick me out? And they said, no, come in, come in. It's really important. And I went in, and they handed me a notice in Chinese. And I thought, well, they're, they're moving me on. And so I read it, and they said, you have to translate this for us into English. And I said, OK. And I looked at it, and it said, the legend of the Christmas stockings. And I said, what's this? They said, oh, we want to send out a Christmas card this year in English. So we're hoping you will trans you know, translate this, this story for us about why Americans hang stockings over the fireplace. And then the police became really friendly because they wanted me to teach them every single swear word in English so they would know when a foreigner is cursing them out during the Olympics. <laughs> so we'd go, out, we'd go out for beers you know, and dumplings, and as the beers kept coming, I would sit and call them every name in the book, and then people would turn it there, and they would write it down and laugh and laugh. So, yeah. The cops have been a good thing in my life, actually, I have to say. <laughs> Comedic effect. I have a couple more, about four more slides to go. Uh, one thing that's changed, too, in the last two years in Beijing is how heritage is being marketed now. It's almost like there were 7,000 lanes in 1949. Now they're down to about 1,300 to 2,000. No one's really sure. Um, and it's almost like a critical point had been reached, like when you overfish salmon or something. You know, say, so like, stop. So now a lot of the destruction has actually stopped, and instead people are marketing it, this old heritage. This is in my neighborhood, Da Jalan. They're using the old Beijing slang for the neighborhood, Da Shirlar. And this is for million-dollar courtyard homes. So in my neighborhood now, they're tearing down the older courtyards to rebuild them a uh, million dollars. And it's interesting to me that this advertisement is only in English throughout the entire neighborhood. It's never in Chinese. Now, I have three slides to go. You're going to see a lot of this street during the Olympics. This is Tiananmen Dajie. This is uh, outside the front gate running south. Tiananmen Square is right behind the gate. You see the marble eyebrows. They re I, th I thought it was funny. They refurbished this, and they kept the German's design from 1901. But they restored the electric trolleys that run down the street. And this is a very divisive project in Beijing, because preservationists are either for or against it. People who are against it say, this is a fake antique. This is, uh, you're doing an Epcot Center sort of Disneyfication, where you're taking the original architecture, you've torn it down, you've rebuilt it, but you've stopped. You've, you've severed this street from being useful to residents. This is where Pizza Hut, Starbucks, that earlier poster I showed you, this is where they're going to be. The new Apple store is going to be here. Um, you know, the bank is gone, the market, places that people actually used. But other people say, look, this is great. One thing that's great about it, look, notice all the benches. This whole area between the flower pots over here is all benches. And that's rare for Beijing. People often ask me, like, why, is, why, why Starbucks? Why Starbucks work here? It's not the coffee. It's the seating. You can't smoke in there. You can sit as long as you want. People won't come and hassle you. It's air conditioned. And I think this is interesting, this project, uh, that it has benches. But it's replacing stuff like this. This is my last slide. And this is Prolong Life Street, that earlier Market Street I had showed you. Uh, the hand came through at the end of April and put up posters that this will be torn down, which spells the end for our neighborhood. So I go back on Wednesday. And I'm going to be there for the, I'm doing a China book tour, if you can imagine. <laughs> It'll be interesting. Um, and I'm going to, my Olympics will be just sitting outside on the lane, talking to my neighbors, watching it for the last time, because it's slated to be destroyed in September. So that's my talk. Thank you for listening. <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. If not, we can adjourn. Not one question. Um, so I lived in Japan for a while, and some mm -hmm. of my favorite places got destroyed. They survived the war, and then the Japanese tore them down and put up ugly concrete things. And their basic comment was, when the old stuff, it's really inconvenient, and mm -hmm. it's kind of dirty, and so, so forth. You know, why on earth do you want this? And is, do you get the same thing in, in China? Definitely. And it's, I mean, Beijing's GDP grows at 10% a year, and it's been growing that way for a decade. So I wouldn't call it irrational exuberance, but it's high-flying times in Beijing. I mean... A reporter asked me yesterday, what's, a, what's your average day like in Beijing? And I said, it's a vision quest. I mean, every day is something amazing and new, and people are really excited to have disposable income and to have new things for the first time. So that's really the case. It's interesting you brought up Japan, because you know, Kyoto survived most firebombing from World War II. It wasn't targeted. But then J Japanese tore down Kyoto in the 50s and 60s, or large parts of it. 
Um, and that's happened in every city. I mean, Paris has gone through this, you know, Moscow has burned down seven times. London was redesigned. New York City pulled down a lot of its historic housing in the 20s to build skyscrapers. Every city goes through these cycles of destruction and rebuilding. Beijing is just doing it later than most, which I think makes it really um, prominent, you know, on the world stage. And I'll often say to architects, you don't have to make the same mistakes we did. And the architects always say, we have every right to make the same mistakes you did. <laughs> Fair, you know. <laughs> Any other questions? I just want to know if you still stay in touch with all those characters in the book, and also how they're all doing, especially the widow. Well, this is an infomercial. I'm here. <laughs> I don't want to give the, the ending away. Um, but yeah, I'm in touch with all of them. Uh, and I'm writing an afterword right now, and I'll be back in August, because a lot of them have moved, and they've done so voluntarily. It's funny, there's a market for everything in Beijing right now. Now there's a market for your eviction settlement. So one of the characters in the book sold the rights to his room, and I said, why are you doing that? And he said, because if I sell now, I'll make more money than when the hand comes and tears it down. I said, okay. So then a new person moved in, a jug-eared policeman from Tiananmen Square. And I said, oh, welcome. And he said, well, I'm not actually living here. I said, what do you mean? He said, I just bought this because when the hand comes and tears it down, I can make more money than my original investment. <laughs> you know, there's no, that's kind of become a market now in Beijing. Well, great. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>